Good morning, this is Professor Shannon Gracie. Today we'll be covering area from the Larson and Edwards calculus text. Uh, when you finish your homework, we want to be able to use sigma notation to write and evaluate a sum. And basically, uh, this gives you sort of a um, gut feeling for what it means to evaluate a definite integral. Okay, so um, let's warm up by, you're going to need these skills. You're going to need to evaluate, be able to evaluate limits like this. So go ahead and pause the movie and warm it on up. All right, let's see how you did. So here, if you recall, this we're going to use, you know, just sort of the shorter definition for limits. So here, um, do you see that the coefficient of the uh, coefficient of the leading term in the numerator are 25 and 1, re respectively, in the numerator and denominator, and they have the same degree for the first one. So this limit is going to end up being good, 25. over 1, which is 25. Everything else zeroes out. Good so far? Okay, this guy, be careful. The first limit is going to be equal to, beautiful, 2 thirds. And then remember that the limit of a constant is the constant. So at the end of the day, getting a common denominator, we'll get 32 thirds. All right? Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. So sigma notation basically will have terms. So the outputs are terms and the inputs are positive integers. Sometimes it starts at zero. So if we want to write a sum, and the way we have it now is a partial sum, basically you have the index of the summation is over here, right? So your inputs go from i equals 1 to n. So basically, a1 is the first output. A2 is the second output. So if we take a look at these over here, we want to find the sum. So we go to this guy, and we'll have, good, we'll have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, because we're plugging in each of these numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 for i, and what will we get for that? We'll get 3 plus 3 is 16, plus 4 is 20, so I think we get, no, 3 plus 3 is 6, plus 4 is 10, plus 5 is 15. Okay, so far? Now, let's take a look at the second one. Now, each time we plug in, we're going to be plugging in, good, we're going to be plugging in a 1, but we'll be squaring it, and then plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, and plus 4 squared. So that'll give us, what, 1 plus 4 is 5, plus 9 is 14, plus 16 is 29. Okay, so far? And then this guy will just be root 1 plus root 2 plus root 3, which is just 1 plus root 2 plus root 3. Okay, so far? All right, so let's um, let's get kind of a big picture idea going on um, and see what this means. So if we were to take a look at, uh, let's just pick the, the I squared graph. If you went on your graphing calculator, right, and you were to graph the related function, so let's Clear this stuff out. Go to our y equals. 
All right, so do you see the related function would be y is equal to x squared. Now the difference here is that instead of only entering in the, po the positive integers, you'd be entering in all real numbers, right? So let's just take a look um, at having our window go from x equal 1 and to x equal to 4. And then the y values, we would have the y max be 16, and the y minimum will be 1. And let's graph it. So that is the related function of the second example that we did. So let's put that over here. Okay. So what we just did right here is this is the graph of, so this is, you know, one, two, three, and four. And the y value ranges up to 16 and starts at 1. And this is the graph f at x equal to x squared. Okay, so far? Now, the difference with sequences, all right, so what I'm doing here is I'm doing – I'm discussing the sequence. So so our sequence here is a n is equal to i squared. So before summing, what we got for the first five terms of the sequence, right, we, we got this list, we would have gotten this list of numbers. So we would have gotten 1, 4, 9, 16 for the, I'm sorry for four numbers. So this here was a1. This guy is a2, a3, and a4. So literally what happens is this. Okay. So for the graph of our sequence, right? So this sequence, the first four terms of the sequence, you would have Instead of an X, you'd have an A N or N rather, and this would be A N. And so we did one, two, three, four. So if this is sixteen, twelve, eight, and four, um, and this is one, two, three, and four, the difference between the two graphs would be. We'd have an ordered pair at 1, 1, and at 2, 4, and at 3, 9, and then at 4, 16. So you only get the integer, the ordered pairs that fall on the positive integers when you're graphing the sequence. Now, what we did for the series right, because when you have a summation, it's a sum. So what we did is we added up all of these results. So this is the graph of a sub n is equal to i squared. Okay. And this is going to be a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4. So hopefully that'll help a little bit. Um, sometimes it's confusing as to what is exactly is going on with a sequence versus a series versus a function, that kind of stuff. So this is this is what um, what's kind of going on. So you can always review in a pre-calc book if you're having some trouble. All right. So summation properties.
it turns out if you have the sum of a constant times a sequence, a i is some sequence, then um, you can factor out the constant, and then you have times the summation of the sequence, which is a series of sum. Uh, secondly, if you have a sum or difference of sequences within a sum, you can evaluate the sum or difference of the separate sequences. All right. So using those properties here, I mean, sometimes it's like so easy, it's hard. Um, this guy, if you just did it regularly, you know, your your A1 would be 2. A2 is 2. You always have an, out, an output of 2. A3 is 2. And A4 is 2. So the, the N in this case is 4. Right? And the K is going to be 2. So you end up getting 2 times 4 because you're adding 4, uh, you're adding 2 4 times, which is 8. Okay, so far? Awesome. Now this guy, we can break up and we can do this as the sum from i equals 1 to 3 of 1 minus the sum from i equals 1 to 3 of i squared. So this one is going to be equal to, good, 1 times 3. This guy is going to be equal to 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared. So we'll get 3, and that's going to be 1, plus 4 is 5, plus 9 is 14, so 3 minus 14, which is negative 11. Good so far? Awesome. All right, so next up, we've got some summation formulas. Now, there's lovely proofs of these um, and visualizations of these online. I'm sure you can you can Google them. The point is to be able to use these in order to um, get the summation out and rewrite it in terms of n, and then evaluate the limit as n approaches infinity. So I'm going to focus on teaching you how to use these for the best purposes of our class. OK? So evaluate the following sum. So first off, do you see that we can use a couple of properties? We can use the sum from i equals 1 to n of 3i minus the sum from i equals 1 to n of i squared. Good so far? Perfect. But this is equal to 3 times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i minus the sum from i equals 1 to n of i squared. Uh, by the way, these formulas here, if you're in my class, will be provided on the exam. Okay, so you don't have to worry about memorizing those. But we have to know how to use them. So now that we've gotten them to look exactly like this, uh, the first one, do you see, will have three times that property two. So you can literally change that summation, i equals one to n of i, to n times n plus one over two. So this here, the summation, i equal 1 to n of i has this output. Okay, so far? All right. And then over here, what does the second one have an output of? Good. We're going to have the i squared one is going to have n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. And so this guy... here 
has this output. Okay, so far? So honestly, at this point, this is how what I want you to gather from, from this exercise. We're going to be using it in terms of a, you know, a, a bigger problem soon. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and pause the movie and give this one a try and see how you do, right? On your mark, get set, go! You can do it! Okay, so let's see how you did. This guy can be rewritten as 6 times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i plus 4 times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i cubed. Now, looking at the formulas, right, we'll be using uh, actually, yeah, summation formulas 2 and 4, right? So this will give us 6 times n times n plus 1 over 2 plus 4 times, great, n squared times quantity n plus 1 squared over 4. And just so we can match them up, remember that this summation has an output of this. And this summation has this output. Good so far? Awesome. Okay, so um, now let's get into a discussion about area. So in Euclidean geometry, the simplest type of a plane region is what? Good, it's a rectangle. The definition for the area of a rectangle is area is base times height is what we'll use instead of length times width. Now, from this definition, you can develop formulas for the areas of many other plane regions, such as triangles. So, to determine the area of a triangle, you can form a what? Rectangle whose area is twice that, good, of the triangle. And then once you know how to find the area of a triangle, really the sky's the limit. You can determine the area of any polygon. It's really powerful. By subdividing the polygon into triangular regions. So if you take a look. Oh, no, our visual didn't come through. Bummer. Okay, that's okay. We'll draw them in. So basically, if you if you take a look here, um, you've got if you have a let's just look at like a parallelogram. If you have a parallelogram, right? You can subdivide this into two triangles. A uh, hexagon, you can do the same thing. Well, that's not very good. So if you have a hexagon, basically you can divide it up like this. something like that, right? And so the list goes on and on. Finding the areas of regions that are not polygons is more difficult. So the ancient Greeks were able to determine formulas for the areas of some general regions by something called the exhaustion me method. So basically the method is a limiting process in which the area is squeezed 
between two polygons, one which is um, inscribed in the region, and one which is circumscribed. about the region. So if you think about it, if you have, again, let's look at a, um, let's look at a hexagon. And so basically what they did was, uh, you know, actually I want to look at a circle. So if we put in a, a circle, so if we put in a circle and let's try to move it where, okay, so what we have right here is we have we have um we have a circle and we have it's completely outside this hexagon. Do you see that? So now if we make another hexagon, right, that is bigger than the first. What happens is, you know, you've got you've got all of these um you know, little triangular areas that you've got going on. And you can estimate I apologize for my sketch, but you can basically kind of estimate the area for the circle by, you know, using this limiting process. Now, it turns out that as you use a polygon with more and more and more sides, right? So if you take your your circle again, And instead of using instead of using a hexagon, let's say you use you know something like A very good one. And this won't won't be perfect. In fact, that first one. Whoop, that's my network. First one really should have been more like more like this. Something like that. But do you see that, um, if I can get rid of the, so what will happen is, you know, that's inside and that's all very close, right? And if you have your, make a triangle first, if you have your, your triangular regions, across something like that 
and then you have your 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 outside uh shape whatever gone it is you know and again this is very very floppy i had a uh <laughs> i had an image but it's not in there anymore sorry about that um so basically the more the more um size you use you know the higher the greater in on your in gone your polygon um the better approximation for the area of the circle you'll get right by this method so um here we go so here the we come to a theorem the limits of lower and upper sums so if f is continuous and non-negative on a closed interval from a to b um then the limits as n approaches infinity of both the lower and upper sums exist and they end up being equal to each other so if uh, lowercase s s of n is equal to you know this limit right now this right here is the minimum value this right here is the maximum value function value on a, any given sub interval right but it turns out as you get to infinitely many sub intervals they have the same sum all right so um Okay, so what we're going to do, I had a little bit of a of a glitch here. For some reason, the the printing didn't turn out right. So we're going to use these figures, and we're actually going to find the upper sum from 1 to 5, right? And then the lower sum from 1 to 5. So basically, what we're doing is we're going to be making, making these um, rectangles. Right, and we're going to use a rectangle of we're going to have the the change in x, okay, is going to equal to one, right? Change in x is going to equal to one. So to get the upper sum, you want to use the highest function value for the rectangle. So here, um, this first one, it's a little tricky, right? Because it changes behavior. It goes from, goes from increasing to decreasing. So we want the upper sum. So what we're going to do is we're going to use 2. X is 2 instead of 1 to subdivide on this one. Okay. And then again, we're going to use 2 because it changes behavior, right? And then our last one will be here. So do you see that our area is going to be overestimated a bit? The area under the curve will be over overestimated. By the amount that you see in the blue. Right? So let's find out you know, what that area is. Okay. So the upper sum is going to be um, equal to the sum of all these rectangles. So we're going to have capital S sub N right, is going to equal to the summation from I equals 1 to N of all these areas. So you're going to have F of capital M sub I, right, and that I at the interval, and then times your delta X. So the base of the triangle is going to be our delta X, or triangle base of the rectangle, right? And then the height of the rectangle are the function values. So what are we going to get? We're going to get the summation from i equals 1 to 5 of f at mi times delta x, which is just 1, right? So this will give us, now what we have to do is look at what we have. So the way we've drawn our rectangles, we're going to have f of mi is what? So let's actually write it out. So it'll be f of 
M1 plus F of M2 plus F of M3 plus F of M4 plus F of M5, okay? So if you look, the highest function value on that first subinterval, which is the subinterval between one and two, right? Between one and two is going to be an output of, good, five. So we'll get five plus, and the second one had an output of, so I'll write out what ordered pairs we're using. So basically, we're using the ordered pair two, five, twice, right? It serves um, it serves two times for two of these intervals. So the first subinterval has an output of five. Second interval also has an output of five. And then we're using over here, we're going to be using three, four, and then four, two. And that's going to give us, we end up with, uh, actually, you end up with just four subintervals, my bad. Sorry about that. Okay, to get the rectangles, you you have, you know, your, it's, it is going to go from one to five, but you end up with just your four rectangles. Okay. Actually, your sub intervals would be one to four. Okay. So now this is going to be five plus five again. Plus, what did we get? We got three, four. So four. And then plus, good, two, which gives us 16 square unit. And remember uh we had we had um delta x was one, so that simplified the problem quite a bit. So this is our upper sum. And for how many subintervals n had four subintervals. Okay. Now coming over here, we want to find the lower sum. All right, so the lower sum in general is the sum from i equals 1 to n. And remember, n is the number of subintervals, the number of rectangles you're making. Um, so we basically, we made all these rectangles, right, and found the areas of them. So then we have, um, that's going to equal to the sum from 1 to n of f of lowercase m, so our minimum i times delta x. So we would get the summation from i equals 1 to 4 of f at lowercase mi times 1. So this is going to give us f of m1, 1, plus f of m2, plus f of minimum 3. Then we'll have plus f at the fourth minimum, or the minimum in the fourth subinterval. So if we just kind of label these ordered pairs, we'll have the ordered pair 1, 4, right? That's the minimum in that uh, subinterval is 4. And then this one, the minimum is yield at an input of 3. So we got 3, 4. This guy is at 4, 2, and then the last is at 5, 0. So we'll be under by this part in the yellow. All right, so let's, uh, let's check out what we've got going on. So we'll have, coming down here, this will give us um, 4 plus 4 plus 2 plus 0, which gives us a result of 10, which is the lower sum 
as 4. All right, so if we wanted to get an average, right, we could get an average um, area. So um, that would end up being the, and this is in square units, if it's area. So actually the lower sum, the lower sums are not in area. So we wouldn't do the square units, the lower, upper sum, lower sum, we've got right there. If we wanted to estimate the area, right, we would say, okay, the area would be the average of these two, which would be 13 square units if we were looking at area, okay? But like we said, these are the, um, this is, the 16 is the upper sum, the 10 is the lower sum, right? Okay, so definition of an area in the plane. Now this is basically saying, hey, if we, by sending n to infinity, we are saying we're going to have infinitely many subintervals. All right. So when you have infinitely many subintervals, the area approximation gets very, very, very good. But there's a condition. You know, of course, f has to be continuous and non-negative on the closed interval from a to b. This is a special case of a Riemann sum, the area of the region bounded by the graph of f. Okay, so f is continuous and non-negative, so that, that's why you're going to get an area because you'll have positive y values and the change in x will always be positive, right? So if it's bounded by the graph of f, the x-axis, and the vertical lines x equals a to x equals b, it's the sum of all these areas and you're going to have infinitely many areas because you are letting the number of subintervals n approach infinity. Okay? So, the way to get the right endpoint is to add a, right, where your big interval starts, plus i times the change in x. Left endpoint, if you want to use your left endpoint, it's this formula. You've got to know how to get at least one of them. Uh, this, these are regular subintervals, meaning that you're using the same width for every rectangle, okay? And that's our delta x. And then this here is just saying that, hey, the input value has to be between the subinterval, you know, the start of the subinterval and the end of the subinterval, okay? So let's do an example. So for this guy, yeah, if we make a little picture here, oops, try it this way. So if we make ourselves a, a picture of the graph, right, what we've got going on, we have x, we have f at x, let's call this 1, 1, this will be a half. This, whoops, this will be a half. And so you'll have ordered pairs at 0, 0, because um, we're starting at 0, and at 1, 1. And then let's get one in the middle. It'll be about here, a half and eighth. So here is a picture of our function. It's bound by these lines, these vertical lines, and it's also bound by the x-axis. So the area of interest ends up being this, area, this region here. And notice that the y values are all going to be non-negative, right? So they're either zero or positive. So now let's identify all the stuff we have, right? So, okay, so we've been given that f at x is equal to x cubed, a is zero, b is one. So delta x, which is b minus a over n, is gonna be one minus zero, which is one over n, 
and I'm going to use the right endpoint for CI. CI will be A plus I times delta X, which is 0 plus I times 1 over N, which is I over N. And our function evaluated at CI is I over N, the quantity cubed, which will give us I cubed over N cubed. Good so far? All right, so we've got all the pieces now. So our area is the limit as N approaches infinity of the summation from I equals 1 to N of F at CI times delta X. Okay, so far? We found a lot of this already. So this will be, and you have to memorize that formula up there. So this will be the limit as N approaches infinity of the summation from I equals 1 to N of I cubed over N cubed times 1 over N. So the area will be, now I can factor out from the just the summation the Ns, the 1 over N to the fourth that we have, because the index of the summation is I. So we'll end up with 1 over N to the fourth times the summation from I equals 1 to N of I cubed. So now you go back to the formula for that and we'll get the limit as N approaches infinity of 1 over N to the fourth and then what was that? Beautiful. N squared times N plus 1 the quantity squared over 4. And so just to match it up, this has a result of this And notice that this n squared fully divides out, and then you'll have 2 left in the denominator. So we'll have area equals in the limit, sorry, as n approaches infinity of n squared plus 2n plus 1 over 4n squared which is the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 fourth plus 1 over 2n plus 1 over 4n squared. So what will happen is our area will be the limit, limit of a constant is the limit and remember that um, if you've got a constant over n to a rational number, a positive rational number, then that is going to be zero out. So you get a quarter plus zero plus a zero. So at the end of the day, the area is equal to a one-fourth of a square unit. Okay? So that is... 4.2. Have a fabulous day. Bye.